Well, good evening. Uh, my name's Jeff Malg, and this is Rushanar Ali, and we're going to be sharing some reflections on social innovation. Just hearing what John was saying, I, I was struck walking here this afternoon, walking past the Martyrs Memorial, which is just around the corner, which is a reminder what used to happen to innovators around here. Uh, I suspect many of the people in this room would have been the heretics and dissidents being burned at the stake in another era, and I guess it's progress that now you are invited into uh, august places like this. But what we're going to do a bit is reflect on the relationship between that cutting edge of innovation and the big mainstream institutions like this. It's exactly a decade since an organization I then ran called Demos published a book called The Rise of the Social Entrepreneur. And we chose that title more in hope than any confidence that it would happen because we were arguing for embattled outsiders to be taken seriously by recalcitrant foundations, governments who were very bad at spotting, let alone backing, the individuals who were driving change in many uh, communities. Um, the good news is that 10 years on, thanks to Grameen, thanks to Ashoka, thanks to Jeff Skoll and many others, as we've just heard, social entrepreneurship has entered the mainstream. There are funds, there are prizes, there are events, there are, there's a place at things like Davos, there's access to power as never before. But it's precisely because of that that we want to argue for what happens next, for how uh, we move on, hopefully with some technology to help us, maybe I'm pressing the wrong button, um, and to look at how we move into an era of social innovation which builds on what's known about social entrepreneurship but takes it further. And as part of the background for this conference, we've published uh, through Said a paper on social innovation. We started it a couple of years ago to inform our work. We couldn't get any funding for it, but did it anyway, partly out of frustration that alongside the libraries on innovation in technology and business, there was so little serious on innovation in the social field, almost no serious books or journals or analyses. And we tried in this work to make sense of how all these things come about, the many different routes there are for innovations through entrepreneurship, through business, through government, through local authorities, through charities and so on. We wanted to look at how many of them in practice were hybrids, not inherently new in themselves, but bringing things together in new ways and how in each stage often different people played critical roles from insurgent campaigning to scaling up. We looked at failures as well as successes and how some failures later on beget successes and the crucial role of the connectors, the people who straddled different sectors, different types of organisation to make sense of change. Our motivation for this in part came from our own work, which I'll say a little bit about in a moment, but also because we're in some ways, students of this man, this is a picture by Charles Hand, his wife, and you'll be hearing from Charles in a moment, a man called uh, Michael Young, who about 20 years ago, 10, 20 years ago, was described by Harvard's Daniel Bell as probably the world's most successful entrepreneur of social enterprises. He was a man who was abandoned pretty much by his parents, but had the good fortune to be sort of picked up by an American philanthropist as a teenager taken to tea with President Roosevelt, and out of that, he got an amazing confidence to believe that anything was possible. And during the course of his life, he was an extraordinary influence on policy, on thinking and ideas. He created over 60 organizations, all of which embodied a vision of how society could be different from patient-led health care to ideas about how in a world beyond chronology, beyond our obsession with chronological age in a, in a very different 21st century society, things would be organized. He created everything from consumers associations to funeral colleges uh, to colleges where patients taught doctors, research councils, and even once a mission to Mars, which didn't actually take off. Um, and in all of that, he always kept his ear very close to the ground, was never over-impressed by power and wealth. And I think the lesson for all of us here is because in all of his ideas started off by being opposed, he said we should always take no as a question, not an answer, and was very bloody-minded in seeing things through. He always was happy to start very small, often with backing from individual philanthropists. The foundations and governments came later. And he was always looking for, whenever he saw a problem, he thought you shouldn't just talk about it, you should just do it 
uh, try and create a solution and not wait for permission from big institutions before acting. And in many ways, his life so exemplified just what individuals can do in social change. And at the end of his life, he created the schools for social entrepreneurs to clone himself, to create more people like the Robert Owens and Abbe Pierre, who died earlier this year, whose homeless projects were copied in 40 countries, or Jose Ariza Mendiarita, can't quite pronounce his name right, the founder of Mondragon, which I think is still now the world's largest social enterprise, and of course, Yunus uh, Mohammed. But he also said before he died that he hoped the movement wouldn't get stuck at the stage of focusing only on individuals. Because although there was a need for, as for a corrective for governments and foundations which had been very bad at backing individuals, all real stories of social change are as much about teams, about networks, about communities as they are about individuals. It used to be said that behind every successful man there was a surprised woman and in a way, behind every successful social entrepreneur, there is a proud but slightly surprised team of others who've also devoted their lives to change. The same is true in science, in the arts, and even more in the collaborative world of the net, open source software, uh, and so on. And this matters because all lasting social change does depend on working with others. As the old proverb says, if you want to go uh, fast you go alone, if you want to go far you go with others. And Harry Truman said, it's amazing what you can achieve if you don't care who gets the credit. I think the other reason for caution about too much of an emphasis on individuals is that so much social change is driven by movements. Last week was the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade uh, in England. And that movement really invented almost everything we take for granted of movements today. The first logos, the first petitions, the first fair trade boycotts, the first mass membership uh, organizations. And they, like feminism, environmentalism, the great movements of the last century, were actually quite suspicious of too much emphasis on individual leaders. And I think what's interesting looking at these is in some ways, I think their story of change fits better with many of the perhaps less individualistic parts of the world, much of Asia, or countries like France, where, as George Bush pointed out, there isn't even a word for entrepreneur. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and for us, at the very least, to keep sight of the social aspect of social entrepreneurship. The other thing we argue in the paper is that if you look at the real story of innovations, they've taken many routes. So fair trade uh, grew up trying to put pressure on businesses. Um, uh, the Grameen and microcredit grew up first in Europe as a grassroots set of organizations. Some became very big, some nationalized, then reinvented in Bangladesh by Mohammed Yunus, and then in many ways becoming part of mainstream business in other parts of the world. Uh, in some countries, political leaders are the drivers of innovation, like Jaime Lerner in Brazil, who transformed his city's transport system, or the amazing Antanas Mocas in, in Bogota, in Colombia, who uses mime artists to control the traffic, uh, and who announced that one evening all the men should stay at home so the women could go out and have a good time. And amazingly, they did, in quite large uh, numbers. Or indeed, universities, out of which came innovations like Aaron Beck's cognitive behavioral therapies, now used in prisons for teenagers, for young people, and so on. All of these are arguments against too rigid a definition of social entrepreneurship, against putting up walls, sending out border patrols to define who is a social entrepreneur and who isn't. Because, of course, only cemeteries have people in tidy rows. Now, I'm going to turn now to Rushanara, who is going to talk... Uh, <coughs> thank you. Who's going to talk about some real examples of social innovation, three examples, two of which she has been uh, very closely involved in. So, Rushanara, over to you. Thank you very much. Our first, first example is the Open University. Uh, the Open University was conceived of by Michael Young, having been influenced by early thinkers uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, primarily in response to looking around him in the East End of London, where we are still based, uh, and the challenges faced by poor uh, communities, and particularly women, who couldn't go on to university in, through the traditional routes, who had children and so on. So the idea was initially established uh, through, conceived of as an NGO, uh, and one of the precursors of the university was the National Extension College. <coughs> uh, 
it became very clear to Michael Young that in order to really scale up, it had to be developed as a public institution. And since it was established, it's been copied around the world, as many, all of you will be aware, and um, has had great success. It was described by Deng, Deng Xiaoping as being, uh, he loved it, as because it was better, quicker, more economical, and efficient. And thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have benefited from this. Uh, indeed, it's been copied by the private sector uh, as well, and the University of Phoenix in the US uh, included. Uh, there's a very high level of satisfaction uh, among students who take part uh, in courses in the Open University, particularly given the amount of control they have in, their, uh, in the learning uh, and in the way that teaching is conducted through this university. But uh, like many innovations, this, this project, like many others, faced huge amounts of resistance. Uh, Oxford and Cambridge couldn't imagine that uh, a university like this could actually, uh, could actually uh, come to fruition. Uh, and the elite primarily, predominantly, thought of it as, uh, as an idea that wasn't going to take off. Uh, it was going to have limited demand uh, and likely to be of poor quality. And as Michael Young, I found it, discovered a quote where he said, uh, although I canvassed ideas with 120 20 colleagues, only one supported me. And after years of struggle, we gave up, and the, gave up trying to set up the idea through, within a university uh, because the inertia was so great. And it's fantastic that that inertia at Oxford uh, uh, certainly is, is no longer so great. Uh, <coughs> So this is, this is a really exceptional example, but, but just, just to reiterate, the resistance was phenomenal. And one, one uh, leading conservative politician at the time did, actually called it blithering nonsense. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted that he was proven uh, extremely wrong. Uh, the next example, we, next example came some 30 years later. Uh, and it's, an, it's, a, it's a subject that I... Uh, worked on, it's an issue I worked on very closely with Michael Young as a student. And this is a really good example of his ability to just spot young people and get them involved, to come up with solutions for themselves. So he put, put us together, a team of us together, to go out and talk to young people in the East End of London, the East End of London uh, uh, in Tower Hamlets, which is uh, the home to the largest Bangladeshi community in the UK, which is very proud of uh, its, uh, its hero, Mohammed Yunus. Um, uh, anyway, it's, an, it's a very proud community, but it's also got enormous amounts of problems, uh, huge amounts of disadvantage and uh, poverty, but coupled with great deal, a great deal of community activism, voluntary sector uh, uh, involvement, and so on. So what Michael Young did was tap into that and uh, set up uh, a project that was a response to some of the conflict that was taking place in the early 90s between young people from different backgrounds, white and minority ethnic backgrounds. Uh, a response to what we found was a lot of young people had very little to do. They were bored, they were getting into trouble by just simply walking around, around the streets. They were being stopped and searched by the police, uh, sometimes arrested. Uh, and so what, what we then turned to was uh, a, a program uh, that we wanted to develop to keep them occupied, raise their aspirations, focus on uh, get to channeling their talents uh, into cre creative activity uh, in the form of something called Summer University. Uh, the first one uh, was established in Tower Hamlets, uh, this project. And what we, what we found was uh, it had enormous success in channeling young people in, uh, in uh, educational activity but through, uh, initially through diversionary activity, through engaging them in filmmaking, in music. Uh, indeed, one of our alumni is a pop star now um, uh, called Dizzy Rascal. Uh, <laughs> um, just in terms of achievements, what the project was able to do was uh, help reduce crime, youth crime, in an area with a growing young pop population. Uh, it has had a great deal of success in reducing drug offences. Again, high, high level of drug abuse in, in, among young people in that area. This project is now being rolled out across London and uh, has been copied around the UK as well. But it's going very much into, this, into the 
phase of being scaled up and facing very, very similar challenges to a number of um, organizations that go through this, this, this kind of experience. Uh, lots of barriers, lots of uh, uh, challenges of going from small to, to, to large, dealing with uh, capacity issues. Uh, but we, we are hopeful that this is going to, you're going to hear more and more about this project because it is, it is, it is, gonna, it is um, growing across London, benefiting thousands of young people and indeed a great deal of international interest, including in countries like China. My last example is an ex example of, it's a private sector model, but it started off very much informally um, uh, from the basement of our office in Bethnal Green. Uh, Michael Young observed that there are a lot of people in the East End of London who had communication issues, who had language barriers. So when they were interacting with local uh, uh, hospitals, police forces, and so on, uh, there were, this, was costing, this was costing a lot of time and money, and also, in some cases, costing lives. So he decided to establish a telephone interpreting service, just very, very basic, but basic service to help communicate, doctors to communicate with their patients, uh, uh, and local police officers to communicate with people they were having to deal with, and so on. And it now provides over 100 languages of telephone interpreting, benefiting, benefiting thousands of thousands of people from around the country. The initial, the initial model was very, very simple, very straightforward. Uh, we're using, using the resources and energies of newcomers in the area, uh, refugees who had language skills, uh, ethnic minority groups who had language skills, often they didn't have access to jobs. Uh, he wasn't afraid to uh, engage those people into jobs even though they didn't have qualifications. And indeed, we worked to try and give them formal qualifications, interpreting qualifications which they later used, on, used for career progression. Uh, my job was uh, to develop the business and to try and encourage public servants to use it. Uh, and sh uh, I, I was rather staggered to find that some of the most educated, well-informed individuals were among the most resistant. Uh, surgeons, doctors, uh, in fact, in one case, I remember vividly at the age of, as a, as a student uh, going on to do these courses, a doctor who put his feet up on the table uh, started reading his newspaper and said, this is a complete waste of time and money. Uh, I don't really understand why you, I have to do this, why I have to sit here and listen to this. Uh, and the only uh, way that we were able to counter that kind of resistance was by demonstrating that this was integral to his job. And it's when he had to deal with a matter of life and death that it became the, 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 the kind of project, the kind of organization that became of value to an individual like that. Uh, and it is now, and this was, this was, this happened up and down the country, wherever we went, we found resistance. We also found champions and supporters, uh, and used them to encourage others to, to uh, buy into the service, to use it regularly. And it is now uh, very much integral to public services across the UK. Michael Young uh, later decided, uh, initially having started it off as a charitable model, to sell it off to a business uh, which is now, it was sold off subsequently for £25 million, having started off on a shoestring as a very small organisation uh, with very, very modest ambitions. Uh, and it is now uh, a, a very much integral to the public services in the UK and being copied in other, other parts of the world. What's interesting about these, these examples is that they are, an ex they are a, a manifestation of examples in the public sector, in the not-for-profit sector, and in the private sector. There are examples of, of social entrepreneurship being ta taking place in imaginative ways, uh, of making change happen uh, in very different ways, starting off in, with modest ambitions, but actually uh, con combining the passions and energies and the insights of local areas uh, and then actually building that up uh, over time with great patience, with great effort uh, and energy. All of these examples demonstrate uh, how an idea can start off very small and embryonic and grow and take root and really make a difference to significant, significant difference to people's lives. Uh, <coughs> and I think to round up, I would say that what is really, what's key is that it doesn't matter what the type of model is, uh, we shouldn't be resistant to whether it's public, private, or not for, not for, not for profit. The key thing is that it achieves change and it, it delivers for those who are in, in greatest need. Thank you.
Over to Jeff. Well, <clears throat> the reason why we think it matters to be lateral and creative about social innovation is that too many of the world's problems are actually getting worse. Climate change is not going to be dealt with without as much social innovation as technological innovation. We've got ageing societies, rising incidents of chronic disease, a whole host of, of, of challenges and problems of very large scale. I think also we're in an era which is moving away perhaps from the dominance of traditional economics in the last century, of business as the main source of authority, because of the recognition that while GDP goes up, other measures of economic welfare have, in many countries, in the US and the UK, started going down. And of course, happiness levels are flat. And that's why more and more people are looking at the importance of social relationships, mutual support, as well as uh, the wealth in uh, people's uh, pockets. And because of that, uh, our, our unhappiness, perhaps, with existing models, which are too inflexible, which don't really work, we've been looking, and in this paper you can get at the business school, uh, looking at what can be done to accelerate social innovation. It's said sometimes the future is already here, just unevenly distributed, or perhaps uh, uh, not fully realized, and we've been looking at what can be done to amplify and enhance it. And our simple analogy is with technological innovation, which gets billions of investment from uh, business and from governments, whereas social innovation is still generally small-scale, marginal, Far too many promising ideas are still blocked or frustrated. And although the starting point for innovation has to be the passion to achieve change, this is the comment from John Stuart Mill 150 years ago, that's never enough. And we look in some detail at processes of change in this document, and we look at the important relationship between what we call the bees, the people with ideas, the entrepreneurs, the individuals often, and teams and groups, and what we call the trees, the big organizations, governments, businesses, foundations, which have the capacity to make things happen. And they usually come late to the good ideas, but without that alliance between the two, change doesn't happen. And to drive those alliances forward, we look at some of the new methods used, new methods of finance, like what I think Rockefeller is doing with Incentive, a very imaginative way of financing technology for development, at the new kinds of ways of incubating ideas, at how to empower citizens and users to drive uh, change, uh, at the many ways in which public sectors can be more porous to ideas, can cultivate their hinterlands and how business can get really engaged with serious social innovation and move a bit away from what's still a temptation for rather glitzy but low-impact initiatives, of which RED, I fear, is just the latest example, away from what some call astroturf projects, which try to look grassroots but aren't uh, really. Uh, and, of course, funders and foundations attuned to the complexities of change. Our own project, Launchpad, led by Simon Tucker, who is here, who's a very brilliant social entrepreneur himself, is trying to apply some of the lessons from technology innovation to social issues. Systematic mapping of needs, systematic mapping of opportunities, teams which bring together people from design, technology, public policy, social enterprise, uh, and, uh, and the grassroots. And earlier this month, we launched a health innovation accelerator, a significant fund and team focused on new enterprises for chronic conditions, chronic diseases, some private sector, some not-for-profit, some probably public. Next month, we launch a, a, one, an equivalent fund and team for learning, practical learning for teenagers. And one of its early projects, a network of seven studio schools across England, has benefited greatly from inputs from some people who were here last year. So thanks to all of you. And in all of those, we're trying to operate a bit more like a venture capitalist, but attuned to social needs. And there's a whole range of projects, if you're interested, from new models of legal service and eBay-like school for everything, for learning, uh, which is being launched in a few months' time, networks to help uh, asylum seekers. Many about face-to-face -face services, but some also using technology, like AI or the web in new ways. This is one we launched just a couple of weeks ago. Very simple, neighborhood fix-it, using Google Maps so you click on a map where you see something wrong with your local community, sends a message to the local official, creates a conversation about what can be done, uh, invented by our, uh, one of our fellows, Tom Steinberg, who also created Pledge Bank, a civic software for bringing people together, which the Google Foundation is now backing, I think, in a couple of dozen uh, countries. All examples of using technology in more creative ways. 
But all of this work has really struck, made us think that many of the things social entrepreneurs are trying to do are very parallel to what people in other fields are trying to do, in design, in technology, in cities, in public policy. And so we've been trying to bring them together in events in Europe and China, and many of them felt what we needed for this whole field of social innovation was new ways of networking people together. And this week we are launching in a sort of beta form a thing called the Social Innovation Exchange. Uh, like many of Michael Young's ideas, we asked various people for funding. They all said no, but we did it anyway. We took that as a, as a question. And it's got a range of partners from uh, Mondragon and Cisco uh, to uh, others like Honeybee and the OECD contributing to it to try and create really a network of networks of tools and ideas and collaborations on things like how do you create jobs for people with mental uh, health problems? How do you create a debt counselling service to speed up the learning across boundaries? And we have virtual thinkers in residence like John Keo, who I think is doing some of the most interesting work on innovation uh, in the US. I'll be very brief on uh, some of the research we're doing. This is just one project which you can read about on copying, scaling up, replication, looking at all the patterns from growth of ideas, models, franchising, and organic growth, and the role of uh, effective demand and favorable environments to that growth pattern, why social entrepreneurs always like franchising, but it's such a hard thing to achieve, uh, why it's organic growth across national boundaries has proved difficult, and so on. So you can read more about that in the document. Let me just conclude. What I think we're really arguing is a very simple point. Before about 1900, most scientific and technological innovation depended only on obdurate, difficult individuals, often working in back sheds uh, and attics. And then in the last century, that whole field became structured, organized, massive investment from business, governments all over the world, without losing some of the space for individual creativity. We think social innovation is beginning a parallel transition which will require new resources, new institutions, new ways of thinking about scaling up, again, hopefully, without losing space for the individual. Schopenhauer, 150 years ago, said that every new truth goes through three phases. First, it's ridiculed, then it's violently opposed, and third, it's treated as self-evident. I think that's been the experience of every social entrepreneur, and our common question is how do we speed up the transition to things becoming self-evident. We think this whole movement is at quite an interesting and important turning point if it's going to, to achieve that. And on the one hand, while celebrating success, we were arguing that a movement of outsiders must be careful not to become too much a movement of insiders, too club class, perhaps too comfortable with big government and big business, and needs to keep its in touch with the dissidents and heretics who used to get burnt on the stake uh, out there. And on the other hand, we're arguing that as a movement, it's got to expand its horizons to the broader issues of social innovation, many other routes for change, many other methods. Gandhi said, you should live like you expect to die tomorrow, but learn like you expect to live forever. And that's the spirit in which we think this movement for change needs to itself keep on moving to. Thank you. I'm going to introduce Charles. Well, thank you for your patience. Uh, it now falls to me to introduce our next speaker, Charles Handy, who is known to many of you, who's been a great inspiration and source of wisdom to me over the years, and whose book on the new philanthropist, including Jeff Skoll, is, I think, available to every delegate. And would you please join me in welcoming Charles to the podium. Thank you.